Beware of false prophets who come to you in the clothing of sheep, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. By their fruits you shall know them. The words taken from today's Holy Gospel, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. As we pass through our lives, day after day, it is so easy to get wrapped up and consumed by the concerns of this world. Our families, our work, all of the bills, never mind the distractions that are constantly clawing to take at us to take our attention away from the one thing that matters, and that is souls. Our souls, the souls of our families, and the souls of our neighbors. The principal purpose for which our Lord became man, suffered, and died for our sins. The principal purpose for which he founded his church upon St. Peter, the rock. The principal purpose for which the Holy Ghost ascended upon the apostles to give life and power to his church and its ministries. It is very important for us to always be objective when we need to consider the current situation in the church. We must always do our best to see things as God sees them. To love him and immortal souls above all else. And contrary wise, to hate sin and evil above all else. Now think about it. If God, from his throne in heaven, deemed the salvation of men so important that he sent his only begotten Son to restore the life of grace lost originally by our first parents, and which is continuously lost by us through actual sin, to restore the friendship between God and man that he had intended to exist from all eternity? Then if we are to see things as God sees them, I certainly believe it is worth our taking a good, serious, and critical look at our understanding and perception of this most important duty of all men. Now the purpose of my beginning today's sermon this way is to establish the very basic and fundamental premise upon which all things of God must be based. Put simply, the one divine law that supersedes all others is the sanctification and the salvation of souls. Every priest or bishop, every religious, both men and women who have ever made their vows or profession in religion, every catechist, all the laity, each and every Catholic through their baptism has been called to work for this premise, the salvation of souls. Now some may be teachers or pastors, confessors, spiritual directors, fathers and mothers leading their families, or those who are single and assist at the church preparing it for mass. All those things are united in purpose because it is for the sanctification of souls. Everyone from the greatest theologians, such as St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, who have taught the truths of the faith, all the way to the simple and illiterate layman who kept the front stairs of the church swept and clean for the people to be able to make it to Mass and hear those truths taught. All have a part, all play a role in the work of increasing God's kingdom. And most importantly, in God's eyes, each and every soul is just as valuable as the next. No matter where we may be land in, this, in that spectrum of God's providential work. Which leads us to today's Gospel, in which our Lord warns us of false teachers, ravening wolves in sheep's clothing. And to take what up from what I have already said, Anyone who purports to be a Catholic, doesn't matter if they be clergy, religious, or laity, and is not working for the salvation and sanctification of souls, then they are exactly what our Lord describes today, wolves in sheep's clothing, deceivers, people with ulterior motives, motives which are sometimes straight out evil and demonic, such as those who promote the Vatican II religion, or sometimes the motives can stem from pride or greed, which is also rampant 
in the Vatican II Church. Now, it would be foolish to believe that ecclesiastical Freemasonry will stop at the destruction of the Novus Order religion. We know that the devil's plan is to eradicate all faith and to corrupt all sacraments, which is why, sadly, there have been some even in the traditional movement who have been willing to lie and cheat and steal in order to see their chapel or mission succeed. This is such a terrible scandal and completely against what God is calling those who hold the true faith to do. Now there are many, maybe not here in this church, but in the world, that will say that those who gave us the Second Vatican Council and those who have promulgated it since have or had good intentions, at least at the outset. Or that what is taught in the council documents is not really wrong, that it is just mis being misinterpreted. The problem with this argument is that, is that it is insincere at best. Most of us have heard the old adage, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging, which is essentially basic logic and reason. And when we apply this to what has taken place over the past 53 years since Vatican II, anyone who has or had a sincere intention would have seen the disastrous fruits caused by it and stopped digging. They would have stopped pushing these evil and godless doctrines. But as we have all seen, they continue to drive their agenda forward regardless of the devastating effect to souls. Remember, wolves in sheep's clothing. They use the structure of the church, absence of the true faith, as a platform to deceive the masses. Just consider what has been lost since the 1960s. This church itself is a testimony of the faith that has been lost. If you were to come here in the 1950s, this church, which has the capacity to sit 800 plus people at a time, would be standing room only. And that with five, six, or seven masses on a Sunday. This beautiful church was initially built as an overflow church for the principal and larger French church, St. Anne's, on the other side of town. And when you speak to the older generations who grew up in this city, you will hear how beautiful and Catholic it was. On the Feast of Corpus Christi, the clergy from around the city would take turns carrying the Blessed Sacrament in procession, giving benediction in different locations as they passed through the city, with the streets closed down for the thousands of people who would be there. In the wee hours of Christmas morning following the Midnight Mass, the faithful all along the streets near the church would leave their homes open for the churchgoers to come in and go house to house to share in the celebration of our Lord's birth. Two full functioning school buildings, grade school and high school, operated by a full convent of teaching sisters, and ministered to by a rectory full of priests. Confessions every Saturday, all day three priests hearing confessions, retreats and missions, now this is just one church. The same story would be told by every church prior to the Second Vatican Council. What took place here between the years of 1965 and 2004, when the Archdiocese finally closed it, is a perfect example of what has taken place throughout the entire Novus Ordo religion as a whole. Just a couple weeks ago, the Diocese of Pittsburgh just announced that it will be reducing the number of parishes from 188 to 48. 140 less parishes in one swoop. By their fruits you shall know them. This is the tried and true, in fact infallible way of discerning someone's intention. Now take what I have said regarding what the faith and faithful looked like 60 years ago and compare it to today. Think about it. Think of that dreadful question our Lord will ask in the end days. Is there any faith left? 
We are here now. It is the season. We are living through the great apostasy. And this apostasy was produced by design. To be so naive, and I would say for many culpably naive, as to believe that the men responsible for the systematic destruction of faith and morals in the Vatican II religion are somehow well-intended is absolutely absurd. Remember what our Lord said, if you are not with me, you are against me. Which means that if the clergy, religious and laity are not working for the sanctification of souls, then they are working against God and are no sons and daughters of the Catholic Church, the one and only Church of Christ, instituted for the sanctification and the salvation of souls. The spreading of heresies, the destruction of faith and morals, the removal of proper catechetical instruction, the emptying of religious houses, and the feminizing of the priesthood, the sex scandal, and the shuffling around of the evil men, the Novus Ordo clergy, by their false bishops, in most cases depraved and immoral men themselves, the corruption of the young by infiltrating the Catholic schools, with all these evil doctrines and immodest instruction, the destruction of the sacraments. This is no mistake. If it were you and you have seen the corrections made, there would be a return to what is true, what is good, and what is holy. However, when you look to Rome, instead of seeing Christ and his teaching, we see the teachings of Antichrist, foretold by Our Lady of La Salette. As Francis Bergoglio, the false claimant to the chair of St. Peter, unapologetically drives forward the agenda of Satan and hell. By their fruits you shall know them. And after seeing 53 years worth of destruction, we can say with certitude that we know them. And I want to make this point abundantly clear, because the longer groups like the Society of St. Pius X, the resistance or indult groups try to pretend that the Vatican II hierarchy has any sort of legitimacy or authority, the deeper the devil is able to sink his claws into our society, into our culture, and into our families. It is okay for us to be upset. In fact, we ought to have a holy and just anger, just as our Lord did in the temple. Not toward any person in particular, because they need prayers. But our anger should be toward the sins of these people, especially the clergy who allowed all this to happen. Angry toward the sacrilege of destroying the sacraments. Angry toward the incredible loss of grace these things have caused. Angry toward the continual crucifixion our Lord must endure as he sees so many of his children deceived in such a way. Because this is more than just an academic debate between truth and falsehood. We're a question of polemics. There are real world consequences to the evils wrought by these false teachers. Consequences that affect us every day. Think of how many disagreements, arguments, or fights you've had regarding the faith with your family, your friends, due to the confusion sown by these errors. Think of all the mixed marriages, all the cohabitation, all the rampant sin and immorality, the complete loss of faith. Devotion to God, Our Lady, and the saints is all but snuffed out. Now this does not mean that it was some sort of a utopia before the Second Vatican Council because people did sin, but at least they knew they were sinning. So let us put first things first. That is, acknowledge the reality of the situation we are in and the crisis in the church. Second, to do something about it. As St. Paul tells us in today's epistle, meaning strengthen our souls and our wills. Do the good, even more so than the evil that we used to do. By growing in grace, receive the sacraments, work on your spiritual life, be instant in prayer, study your faith, so you will have the confidence you need to defend Christ and his truths 
when you are called to do so, because you will be. This is a war between heaven and hell. There is no middle ground. So let us pray to God and all the angels and saints to support us and obtain for us the grace and the strength that we need to hold fast to our pure, holy, and unadulterated Catholic faith.